All right, so section 2.3. Like I said, I wanted to get through 2.4 and 2.5 before I got back to 2.3. Because 2.3 is really just about our different interpretations of the derivative. But before we get to the interpretations of the derivative, let's talk about the interpretations of the difference quotient. That's what this thing is called. The difference quotient really just tells us what the average change, the average rate of change of a function is. So one way to see why this is to consider the example of velocity. In this case, we've got a thing. We're tossing it up and letting it fall back down. We're looking at the rate of velocity. We're looking at the average velocity over a period of time. So in this particular question, we're given the equation that the height of an item that's been thrown up, negative 16 t squared plus 100. So this is the initial velocity, the velocity it's thrown with. And this is the acceleration due to gravity. So it's accelerating down, but initially it's gonna go up, right? And we're asked to find the average velocity at a couple different periods of time. Well, we know that velocity is going to be delta H over delta T, right? Everybody agree? Makes sense because it's the change in distance over a period of time. It's velocity. And we know that delta H, well, this thing is going to be negative 16 t plus delta t plus 100 minus negative 16 t squared my mistake I forgot the square on that plus 100 all divided by delta t Right? Is everybody with me on this? All right, so it means we gotta do some, some algebra, right? Just to simplify some things here. Start off with, let's expand this T plus delta T out. We're going to get negative 16 times the quantity t squared plus 2t delta t plus delta t squared plus 100 minus, let's go ahead and distribute this negative all the way through. When we do, we're going to get that this is plus 16 t squared minus, or, yeah, minus 100, all divided by delta t So when we distribute the 16 through, we're going to get that this 16t, uh, 16t squared, it's going to cancel with this one, right? Agreed? We're going to get that these hundreds cancel. So we're going to be left with negative 32 t delta t 
plus 16 delta t squared all divided by delta t. We're going to lower this by a power and cancel this delta t out, right? To get negative 32t plus 16 delta t. Is everybody with me on this? All right. So, just for the sake of making this nice and neat to see and easy to follow, let's go ahead and rewrite all of this. Negative 32t plus 16 delta t. Yeah. All right. So if we want to find what the average velocity is from time equal to one to time equal to two, we know that initial time, T naught, TA is going to be 1, TB is going to be 2, and delta T is 1, right? Because the difference between the two, that's just 1. So, plugging this all in, this will be TA here. This is our delta T. We're going to get that delta H over delta T is equal to negative 32 times 1 plus 16 delta t is also going to be 1. Or just negative 16 feet per second. Or time in the interval one to two. Now this is the average velocity in that time span, right? That's assuming I didn't mess up any of the algebra. Is everybody cool with this? Yep. Yeah. Guess what? I messed up the algebra. I thought I did. This is supposed to be minus here. I forgot to distribute the negative. So this should be 48 then. I forgot to distribute the negative associated with the 16, right? here, everything else works out, right? Like if we were to try to find from the interval, say 1.15 or 1 to 1.5, we do the same thing. We would say, all right, what's our initial time? TA. This T is going to play the role of TA here. So that's going to be where we start off at. But then we're going to say plus some extra time. Does that make sense what I mean? Yeah. 
So we can think of this as T naught, T A, T B, whatever you want to call it. It's wherever your initial time measurement starts at. And then delta T will be however far out you're going. Is everybody cool with this? Yeah? Awesome. So, given this definition, we can interpret then the derivative as the instantaneous rate of change. So what does that mean? Well, let's think about what velocity here means, right? Velocity is the rate of change of an object's position, right? So if you're measuring my position, from this wall, and I'm walking away from it. The rate of change is going to tell you from time zero on how far I'm going, how far I've gone per moment, right? Make sense what I mean? It's not going to tell you how far I've actually gone going to tell you per moment how far I'm going. Does that make sense what I mean? Kind of sort of, yeah. So another way to think of it is you're in your car, right? You're going not to the bar because you can't drive back to the bar, but you're going somewhere akin to a bar driving along, you look down at your speedometer. Your speedometer is going to tell you you're going 25 miles an hour. That's not how far you've gone, that's how fast you're going, right? That's what this instantaneous rate of change is going to be. And this average rate of change is just going to be, given some interval of time, how fast on average have you been going? What we're going to talk about now is at a particular moment, how fast are you going? That's what your speedometer reads. Cool? All right, so, oh, same problem, but now we want to find it instantaneously. We know that's going to be the derivative here, right? Everybody agree with that? What we want to find now is going to be the derivative of this equation. So the derivative of this equation, dh dt, is going to be negative 32t. Everybody agree with that? If H, if H is equal to this function of time, negative 16 T squared plus 100, then the derivative of this should come out to be negative 32 T. Is everybody cool with that? Now notice the difference here. All we're doing is saying let's let the limit of delta t go to zero, right? Yeah. So looking at this, plugging in one, you see I get negative 32 out. So what does this tell us? This is telling us that at exactly one second from when we started, we're going to go 32 feet per second. And if, in this example, I think we were throwing an object up, right? 
Is everybody cool with this idea? So one interpretation of the derivative then is to think of it as the instantaneous rate of change. Another example of a similar idea might be talking about a diver, right? The diver jumps up and falls back down to the earth. He has an initial height of 32 feet. And initially jumps with a velocity of 16 feet per second. My bad, this first problem, the object was 100 feet off this. This is my mistake. But in this case, diver starts off at 32 feet above the ground, jumps up at a rate of 16 feet per second, and acceleration due to gravity is negative 16 feet per second squared, or 9.8 meters per second squared, depending upon the system you prefer. When does the diver hit the water? What would y'all say? What do y'all think this guy hits the water? What do we have to find? This is representing his height, right? That's what this equation represents. So when he hits the water, presumably it's going to be at zero, right? At height equal to zero. So whenever this thing is equal to zero, but hey, this is a parabola, it's going to be equal to zero twice. So which zero value are we going to want to take? Well, let's think about the setup of this problem. When t is equal to zero, this thing's going to be equal to 32. So our parabola should look something like this, right? The value of time we're going to want is the positive value of time, right? Like we're not going to go backwards in time. We want this positive value. So how might we find that? What do you all think? Negative b over 2a. We could use the vertex form. Um, or we could just go ahead and plug in the uh, quadratic formula, right? Or we'll factor out the common factors. Notice we got that those two parts, negative 1 and 2. When we find that it's equal to 2, that's the value we want. The next question is, Now that we 
know time is equal to two. The next question is, what's the velocity? Well, the velocity is going to be the derivative of this function, right? So that's going to give us velocity as a function of time is going to be equal to negative 32t plus 16, plugging in 2 now. This is going to give us negative 64 plus 16, or negative 48. And in fact, it does come out to be negative 48. All right, now, for some vocab. Whenever we start talking about marginals, we're just talking about derivatives. So marginal profit, it's the derivative of profit. Marginal cost, the derivative of cost. Marginal revenue, the derivative of revenue. And just as uh, some notes to, to be aware of, profit is going to be equal to revenue minus cost. Makes sense, right? Whatever you get off of your good minus the cost of producing that good, it's going to be your profit. So again, marginal profit. It's the derivative of profit, the derivative of revenue is marginal revenue, the derivative of cost is marginal cost. All right, so we're given the profit as a function of the number of units we're selling. We were sold, we're selling. The first thing we want to do is find out what the marginal profit is. given 50 units were sold. So the first thing we're going to want to do is find the derivative, right? see all this played out. But the actual profit, well, that's going to be the difference from if we made 50 to if we made 51. So we take the difference of the two, 
comes out to be eleven dollars fifty three cents. Notice the difference here. Why is there a difference in the way this changes? The derivative measures the rate of change. Well, we've changed the way we're selling this by one unit, and the derivative is different by three cents. Why is that? What do you all think? is if the derivative is supposed to measure the rate of change at 50 units. Then the next unit over, presumably, we should have $11.50 in profit. That's my point. Does that make sense what I mean? But that's not the case. Why? Because what the derivative is measuring is the change for a really small change in x. So we agree this is true, right? Yeah. So this thing is like 50 plus delta x, right? For delta x is equal to one. Agreed? What the derivative is measuring is what the change is if this delta x was really small. Now to us, one unit seems small, but in the sense of numbers, one is giant that should. Like it is huge in the sense of what numbers can be. And in the sense of the derivative, because what the derivative is doing is looking at what's called the infinitesimal, right? And the infinitesimal is as close to zero as you can possibly get. Well, compared to that, what is going to be huge? So the derivative, yeah, it's accurate as a measurement, as a prediction of what you're going to make, like what the difference in your profit will be but it's only accurate up to so far. Does that make sense what I mean? Yeah? And that is what the point that they're trying to get at here. The marginal profit approximates what we expect or what we can expect the profit to be. So a great example of where you might use something like this well let me actually skip to the next problem because I think they start explaining some of this. Let's go back to normal size. There we go. It's one of these next problems that explains this a little bit more. But before we get to that point, let's consider the case where we got a demand function that we're searching for, right? 
uses them for making up on the demand function and the total revenue function. So revenue is going to be whatever your demand is times whatever you're selling the, the good at, right? The price of the good. Make sense what I mean? So we've got a business that sells 2,000 items per month at a price of 10 each. It is estimated that the monthly sales will increase by 250 units for each 25 cents in reduction of price. We want to use this to set up the demand function and the total revenue function. So let's first start with demand. Demand here is going to tell us that we're going to lose, or we're going to gain, 250 units sold for every 25 cents in reduction of price, right? So given that, and that the original price of each is $10, so this is going to be how much we can start off with, right? What I'm saying is, this is the initial cost of it, right? So if we take 25 cents off, trying to set up and why this is such a weird problem is that the initial thing we've got is our good is initially set up at why can I not spell today The price the good is currently set at is going to be P. And for every 25 cents that we take off, we're going to gain 250 people, 250 units sold. So the difference between this and this, divided by 25, 0.25, I mean to say, is going to give us the relationship between how many more people we have and the initial stagnation point, right? Does that make sense what I mean? Kind of, sort of. So what I'm saying is, We're taking off money, right? So this is going to be less than that initial ten dollars. And what we want to know is how many chunks of twenty-five cents we've taken off, because we know for every chunk of twenty-five cents, we're going to gain two hundred fifty people. Two hundred fifty years, I should say. So this sets up the relationship between the change in price and how many quarters we're taking out. Multiply that by the 250. Now we know how many extra units we're selling. Add in the initial 2,000, that's where we started off. At $10, we're initially selling 2,000 items. This is our demand. Is everybody cool with this? 
Now, having said that, solving for P, the price, right? We're going to find, I'm just going to go ahead and point to it. It's going to find that the price relative to the demand should be set at $12 minus X over a thousand. So if that's the case, then revenue is going to be equal to the demand times the price. Well, we know demand is equal to this, and we know price, because they already did the work for us. Price is going to be equal to 12 minus x over 2,000, or 1,000. So as revenue is equal to demand times price, this whole thing is going to work out to be x times 12 minus x over 1,000, right? Working everything out, we're going to get 12x minus x squared over a thousand. Is this making sense so far? You know this problem's convoluted. That's why I wanted to have this entire thing on one slide for everyone. So what we have is our demand function. And here, this is our revenue function. It's not what I wanted to do. Everybody at home, is this making sense to you? Yep. Is it making sense so far? Looking good. Awesome. Sweet. All right. So, using all of this idea, let's start looking at another problem because I know this is this is convoluted. In this other problem, we're given that the demand function is as follows: the price of the commodity good is going to be six thousand minus x the demand divided by 20,000, 60,000 minus x divided by 20,000. the revenue per hamburger per monthly sale of 20,000 hamburgers or the marginal revenue when x is equal to 20,000. All right, so in this problem, we're given the demand function we're asked to find the marginal revenue.
Okay? And we know the revenue is going to be the price times the demand, right? Makes sense. First, let's do some reductions here. We can rewrite this as 3 minus x over 20,000. Agree? Because we can break up this fraction as 60,000 divided by 20,000 minus x divided by 20,000. So that's where we're going to get that 3 from. Using that over here, that's going to make a lot of our work easier. 3 minus x over 20,000. It's going to be equal to 3x minus x squared over 20,000. This looks way better than what I did before anyhow, right? So because of this, we know the derivative of the revenue, or the marginal revenue, is going to be equal to 3 minus 2 times x times 1 over 20,000. Yep. Which we can simplify some. 2, 3 minus 1 over 10,000 x. Yeah. Is everybody with me on this? So the marginal revenue At 20,000, it's going to be equal to 3 minus 20,000 divided by 10,000, or 3 minus 2, or just 1. Everybody agree with this? Let's check some work now. All right. Given that the demand function, price as a function of demand, is equal to the 60,000 minus x over 20,000, we know the revenue is going to be the demand times the price. So we can simplify all of this a little bit. They simplify it slightly different than what we did. Applying the derivative. Notice they're going to get the same thing if they were to simplify this, right? 
This 20,000 and this 60,000 cancel out to be three. Minus two over 20,000, that's gonna get one over 10,000. That's X, right? So then plugging in 20,000 into your marginal revenue function, you get a buck per unit. And with that, it is 920. So I will let y'all go. Let's stick around if anybody has any questions. I think everybody's been the exam, by the way. <laughs>